This video is about police brutality in France. You probably noticed yourself that the French police repeatedly makes the news for excessive police brutality. And in this video, I will try to explain to you why this is and what institutional developments and historic events led to the French police being so notoriously violent. As you can probably imagine, some of the things shown in this video are in French, such as an article in protest written by Emile Poisset. I could not find an English translation of this article, and it is useful to know at least a little bit of French when talking about France. Speakly is a language learning app made by two polyglots that can assist you in learning foreign languages, no matter if you just want to pick up the basics so you are able to read a few texts or try to become fluent and converse with people. Speakly is a great means by which you can get into learning a language. Speakly is available on both web and mobile and you can click the link below to get right into learning any languages. Speakly will provide you with a daily 30 minute long language exercise together with music recommendations to keep you refreshed refreshing your skills and make learning a routine. So it is intended to make the language you want to learn a part of your life, which really is the best way of learning a language. You can start learning with Speakly right away by using the link in the description. You will get a seven day free trial. And if you sign up for a year, you'll get a 60% discount. Thank you very much to Speakly for sponsoring this video. The French government has said it is considering all options, including declaring a state of emergency after a third night of escalating violence and rioting in cities and towns across France. Hundreds of police were injured last night and more than... In our day and age, when we think of police brutality, the first thing that comes to most of our minds is the United States. We Europeans like to point our fingers at the Americans when this topic comes up. But if we are honest, that is really dishonest. The Athens Police Department was for decades notorious for its corruption and abuse of power. For a long time, the Greek police was considered to be the worst in Europe. But there's one European country in particular that stands out in this conversation. As much as we Europeans like to tell ourselves that we have better functioning and more humane police services than the Americans, there is one country whose police record rips that comforting but dishonest illusion to shreds. The French police. The French police constantly and consistently makes headlines for its notorious police brutality. The brutal methods with which it disperses crowds, excesses in violence, killings and racist abuses of power, mostly focused in and around the police department of Paris. Why? To understand why, we have to go back to the 1940s. After the French defeat of 1940, France was divided up into two zones, one occupied by the Germans, the other under the governance of the Vichy regime of Marshal Pétain. This is one of the most painful chapters of French history. The Germans plundered France, billions in goods were extracted, and the occupation regime was infamous for its brutality. And one of the most painful segments of this chapter is what became known as Collaboration. A core fact about the Second World War and the Nazi terror over Europe is that the majority of the crimes committed by the Nazis would have never been possible were it not for the cooperation of the institutions, structures and peoples of the places the Nazis occupied. It was the interior ministries and in particular the police forces of occupied countries on which the Nazis mainly relied for the enforcement of their occupation order, but also for the organization of their crimes. The Nazi operations of rounding up, deporting and massacring Jews were called Polizeiaktionen for a reason. From Norway to France to Greece, the Jews who were deported were rounded up by local police who collaborated with the Nazi occupiers. The police in Nazi Germany was under the authority of the Sicherheitsdienst, SD, which was a branch of the SS. And what many do not know or often forget is that the SS Einsatzkommandos, which carried out the mass murders of Jews in Poland, Lithuania, Belarus and Ukraine, consisted almost entirely of German police officers. One has to imagine that regular German street cops received their orders to conduct a so-called Polizeiaktion on the Eastern Front. They were armed and shipped out just behind the front lines of the Eastern Front, where they spent months shooting Jews at death pits, after which they returned to police duty in German cities as if nothing had ever happened. After the Second World War, this aspect of the Nazi terror and rule was largely forgotten. There were police officers working the streets of West and East Germany who had spent the war murdering thousands of men, women and children over death pits and now just melted back into society as supposedly respectable professionals in service of society. 
By the 1960s, the German reckoning with history began and we began seeing a gradual change. It is ironically in the countries that Germany had occupied, where these legacies in occupation through collaboration were often left to fester to their worst extent. Maurice Papon was a French civil servant who during the Nazi occupation was appointed the general inspector on the Jewish question over the territories occupied by the Germans in France. In this position, Maurice Papon became the boss of the French police in Nazi-occupied France. He restructured and reorganized the French police, heavily centralized in Paris, as an organization that worked for the Nazi occupation. No longer in service of France, the police of France became an institution at war with France as part of an occupation of France. Instead of investigating crimes in France, the French police became an instrument of committing crimes against the French. Instead of serving the French, the police now helped arrest and torture members of the Resistance. They helped round up French civilians to be deported for forced labor in Germany. They helped establish a Gestapo system of organized mass torture. And they assisted the Germans in acts of brutal revenge as punishment for acts of resistance, in which notoriously 10 French citizens were shot by the Germans for every German killed in France by the Resistance. Maurice Papon was also in charge of rounding up the Jews of France for the Nazi final solution. He was, however, incapable of rounding up most French Jews. French citizenship made their deportation difficult. However, non-French Jews fell into a legal gray area, especially Jews from countries that the Nazis had occupied. Those became stateless and would become the primary victim of Maurice Papon, the police he commanded, and the Nazi authorities to who he handed them over. Maurice Papon personally organized, ordered, carried out, and oversaw the deportation of 76,000 Jews from France to Auschwitz, of which only 2,500 survived. The main logistical center that Maurice Papon built to organize all of this was the infamous transit camp at Drancy. After the war, Maurice Papon forged a document crediting himself as a member of the French Resistance. He successfully managed to hide his involvement in everything that he had organized and commanded, and disguised himself as a meek little French bureaucrat who worked under difficult circumstances while secretly supposedly working for the Resistance. Charles de Gaulle commended him as a man who worked with honor under difficult circumstances and made Maurice Papon the prefect of Corsica with the main job of suppressing Corsican separatism. After doing that job successfully, he was made the chief of police in the French protectorate of Morocco in 1954 and of French Algeria in 1956, with the task of establishing and maintaining order. In French Algeria, Maurice Papon oversaw the establishment of a state-run torture network in which the French authorities systematically tortured Algerians. What is striking is that Maurice Papon established in Algeria a system of state-managed mass torture that was almost the exact same as the Gestapo system that was built in Nazi-occupied France by Klaus Barbie. A system that Maurice Papon, one of the chief collaborators in Nazi-occupied France, was very familiar with and which he now copied in the service of French imperialism in Algeria. In 1958, when the Algerian independence movement, FLN, started being active in France, Charles de Gaulle appointed Maurice Papon as the chief of the Paris police department to restore order. This series of events that began with the Nazi occupation of France in 1941 had a substantial impact on the French police and the security institutions of the French state. It meant that after the Second World War, Frenchmen who had worked with and for the Nazis and assisted in the crimes of the Nazis as part of the occupation of France remained in charge of, or at least in employment, with the post-war French state and were put in charge of the security apparatus of the remaining French colonies, most prominently in the police of mainland France, whose boss was one of the leading Nazi collaborators and commanded a police that consisted, by and large, of Nazi collaborators. Under Nazi rule, the French police had been transformed into an institution at war with France, and after that war, the French state failed to undo that transformation. Instead, it swept it under a rug. The police of France remained an institution at war with France, but far more crucially, at war with the stateless outliers who found themselves within a legal grey area because of the policies of the French Empire. During the Nazi occupation, those outliers in the grey area had been the Jews. Now, after the war, it was the Vietnamese, Cambodians, Senegalese, Congolese, Tunisians, Moroccans, but above all, the Algerians.
The men who had worked for the Nazis came to be in charge of the French police at the height of the Algerian War for Independence. And we see their methods and means reflected in how, for example, the French state refused to call the Algerian War a war and instead referred to the war as an action policière, using similar administrative euphemisms that the Nazis had used in the lands they had occupied, such as pacification. This does not shift away the blame. Many French commanders of the Algerian war were also commanders in the Free French Army, but it reflects a worrying legacy. The brutality with which the French police acted and would come to be known, as well as the means by which some of the security organs of the state engaged, were a symptom of a French failure to confront a dangerous historical legacy. Algeria was at the time officially a part of France and supposedly not a colony. Algerians who had for a long time been treated as second-class citizens were given, in theory, equal status with the rest of France, but in practice still had a parallel status. The statute of 1947 governing Algeria defines Algeria as a group of départements endowed with civil personality, financial autonomy and a particular organization. This so-called particular organization is the avowment of the difference between mainland France and Algeria and the rights of the people living under both. For instance, Algerian women were forbidden from participating in politics despite French women being allowed to do so, because the Algerian assembly refused it for them. This assembly was not compromised mostly of Algerians, but by half of French citizens and by half of both the French-aligned Algerian elite and the Algerian Muslim population, as it was called. As a result, not only was there in practice no popular sovereignty of the Algerian population, but the Algerian legislative was not even in tune with the egalitarianism of the French mainland, despite being controlled by it. So in practice, despite all the legal babble, Algeria was still a colony. The legal babble was in essence nothing but an attempt to hide the fact that Algeria was a colony and that Algerians fell into a semi-stateless and disenfranchised grey area of the law. In mainland France, after a series of targeted assassinations of French police officers by the FLN, Maurice Papon issued a set of illegal police directives that banned Algerians from public spaces like theatres, concerts and sports stadiums. He also issued a curfew banning Algerians from going out after 8pm. Officially this was illegal, and Maurice Papon knew this. His directives never use words such as banned or forbidden but euphemisms like I recommend you do not or I suggest you do not, which is extremely similar to how the Nazis disguised their intentions in occupied countries with euphemisms. Maurice Papon riled up the police force to act more violently. In a directive to the French police in 1961, he wrote that for every strike against a French policeman, the French police shall strike back tenfold. A directive that is eerily reflective of how under the Nazi occupation, ten French citizens were always shot for every German killed by the resistance. A reference and instruction that many in the French police, who once had worked as Nazi collaborators, would have probably understood. Maurice Popon basically gave the French police a license that if they saw an Algerian out at night or at a theatre or cinema, they had the permission to drag those Algerians away and beat them to death. Maurice Papon also did something else. As mentioned before, when he worked in Algeria, he oversaw and managed a system of systematic torture targeting Algerians that was almost an exact copy of the Gestapo torture system in Nazi-occupied France against the French resistance. When Papon became the police chief of Paris, he imported this torture system back to Paris from Algeria, constructing an institution of systematic torture run by the Paris police in which Algerians were arbitrarily arrested, brutally beaten, had their fingers cut off, waterboarded and often even killed. A system of torture invented in Nazi-occupied France by the Gestapo was brought to Algeria by those who had worked with the Nazis and then brought back to France by those same men in the late 1950s. By the time Papon became police prefect, many French police officers had already joined a domestic French terrorist organization, the Organisation de l'Armée Secrète, or OAS. The OAS was created in 1961 as a response to de Gaulle increasingly pulling out of Algeria and acknowledging that the war for Algeria was lost. 
The OAS was founded at a secret meeting in Francoist Spain by a conspiracy of far-right French officials who wanted to enforce French rule over Algeria with an escalation of extreme violence against Algerians. De Gaulle escaped an assassination attempt and then ordered Papon to take back control over the French police. The means to do this would be through violence against Algerians, and Papon did this through organizing a massacre. Most people to who I have mentioned this are somewhat confused when they first hear of this. When I say the words, the Paris massacre of 1961, many think that I'm just making this up, or are shocked of this assembly of words. Massacre is a word that we associate with dictators, with undemocratic regimes, with tyrants and war criminals. Massacres, especially massacres carried out by officials of a state, are not something that we believe can happen in a democratic and supposedly free country. Massacre is what happened under the Nazis. Massacre is what happened in Hungary in 1956, in Prague in 1968, in Srebrenica. But not here, not in Western Europe, not in a republic, and certainly not in the land of liberté and égalité. But that is exactly what happened on the 17th of October 1961 in Paris, organized by Maurice Papon and the French police that he commanded. On that day, the FLN and Algerian labor unions had called for a protest in Paris against the directives and curfew issued by Maurice Papon that discriminated against Algerians and in solidarity for Algerian independence. Around 30,000 Algerians came to peacefully protest in Paris and around 7,000 French police officers then committed the massacre. They drove Algerians into street corners and shot them with pistols and machine guns. They viciously beat Algerians to death. They rounded up 7,000 Algerians and transported them to the Palais du Sport and warehouses outside of Paris that had been rented by Maurice Papon in preparation for the massacre. They did so with city buses that had been confiscated at the orders of Maurice Papon. In these places, the Algerians continued to be beaten and several died. But probably the most famous place of that massacre that night is the bridge at the Pont Saint-Michel over the River Seine. At that bridge, the Paris police rounded up dozens of Algerians, broke their arms and legs, and then threw them from the bridge into the Seine to drown. What is extraordinary is that we do not know just how many Algerians were murdered by the French police that night. We can only guess, and we only have estimates. The first to research estimated that around 30 to 40 Algerians were murdered. Today we know that at the very least 300 Algerians were murdered, and by some estimates up to 500 Algerians, or possibly even more, were murdered that day in Paris, in the open, for everyone to see, by officers of the French police. There are even pictures of the massacre as it unfolded on the streets, squares, bridges and subways of Paris. Yet for a long time this was almost completely unknown. The newspapers of the next day do not mention what happened. Some of them mention a few scuffles or riots. The New York Times downplays the events of the night and blames the Algerians. And the reason why we do not know how many were killed or who they were is that everything was covered up by the police and chiefly by Maurice Papon. He had meticulously prepared the massacre of this night. The Algerians who were rounded up were detained in warehouses and stadiums, mainly in the Palais du Sport, and relentlessly beaten for days during which dozens more died. Those who survived were rounded up and deported back to Algeria. By the 20th of October, three days after the massacre, Ray Charles performed a famous concert in the Palais du Sport where just a day before 7,000 Algerians were detained, beaten, and possibly even over 100 murdered. The slums around Paris, in which Algerians had lived, were bulldozed into the ground. We know these Algerians were men and women. We know they came from impoverished rural Algeria, and we know that they worked low-income jobs in Paris and other French cities. But the infuriating thing is that we do not know their names. Only a few of them are known to us. In the weeks after the massacre, when bodies washed up the Seine river banks, the Paris police would clamp down on any opened homicide investigation by rural police departments. The corpses were confiscated, written off as suicides or death by drunkenness of random homeless people. The bodies were then burnt and the ashes scattered in the graveyards of the unknown homeless and vagabonds. The bodies of those beaten to death had their death certificates falsified as suicides, accidental deaths, or other causes of death. All we know is that there was a sudden spike in the records of death that night and the following days, which can only be explained with the violent, systematic murders of hundreds of people within a very short period of time. 
In the weeks, months, and years after this massacre, it is as if these human beings had never existed, or had only existed in the vaguely to barely known of moments of their unknown deaths. Maurice Papon was again in charge of covering everything up, hiding the paper trails, and destroying the evidence of what had happened. It is striking that the same men who 20 years before had deported Jews from France to Auschwitz under Nazi occupation had carried out the largest systematic mass murder that ever happened in a democracy. They did so in the open, and not one of them was ever prosecuted or held accountable for what they did that night. The officers who committed the massacre continued their careers and constructed the institutions of what the French police continues to be to this very day. Maurice Papon continued his career and was widely regarded in France as a reliable and honorable civil servant. He left the public sector in 1967 to become CEO of the aerospace company that would later merge into EADS. He was elected as a representative in the French parliament in 1968 and began a career as a conservative politician, re-elected twice and served in the French parliament until 1981. He became minister for budget management under Raymond Barr. Under the French president Valéry Giscard d'Estaing, he acted as the main man of contact between the French government and the Argentine fascist junta to broker deals for selling French weapons to the Argentinian junta and to Augusto Pinochet. After his parliamentary career, he was elected and continued to work as the mayor of the small French town of saint amand montrand It was not until the election of François Mitterrand that the career of Maurice Papon came to an end. The election of the first socialist president in almost 30 years allowed for matters that were unquestionable in the decades before to be reopened and questioned again. People whose reputation was first untouchable suddenly became closer examined. Questions began being asked about Maurice Papon and what exactly he had done during the Nazi occupation. Robert Batinter became French Minister of Justice, a French Jew who had survived but whose father and many members of his extended family had been deported to Auschwitz and murdered. Maurice Papon's carefully crafted self-image of the reliable and honorable civil servant began to unravel. It was revealed that he had probably forged his membership in the Résistance, and gradually the fact that he was the man who had organized, ordered and carried out the deportations of Jews from France to Auschwitz came to light. At the age of 77, he was finally put on trial in 1997 and sentenced to life in prison in 1999. He only served three years until being released on health issues in 2002 and died in 2007. Maurice Papon was, however, never held to account for the Paris massacre of 1961. Not one of those involved ever was. That event almost completely disappeared from the collective memories of a nation, but it ultimately refused to be forgotten. Here We Drown Algerians is a graffiti that an unknown student made in protest on the Pointe Saint-Michel Bridge a week after the massacre in 1961. The bridge where the French police rounded up Algerians, broke their arms and legs, and threw them into the Seine to drown. The graffiti was cleaned away, but throughout the years, the picture and the graffiti came back, over and over again. The phrase became almost a sort of motto of remembrance, of raging against forgetting, and of protest against the crimes of the French state. As mentioned before, the 1980s were a time in France in which all certainties suddenly were open for questioning again. Back in 1961, on the 31st of October, the police officer Émile Portier, a veteran of the French Résistance, anonymously published the following protest letter directed toward the public, titled, A Group of Republican Police Officers Declare. It is a harrowing account of what happened that night on the 17th of October, of Algerians beaten in police custody until their organs burst, and having their fingers cut off by sadistic police officers while the police chief just watched of how police officers systematically destroyed the documentation and IDs of Algerians before murdering them to destroy evidence of their existence, how police officers tied up Algerians in courtyards of police stations, doused them in gasoline, and then burnt them alive. Emile Poisset's complaint did not have the effect he intended. There was no public outcry. Instead, Maurice Papon launched an internal police investigation to find and punish him. But Emile Poisset's letter did play one important role. It was a record of what happened, testimony of what happened. Small as it may seem at the time, it would ensure that events would not be forgotten and that a document of reference would continue to exist together with the memories. 
people remembered. In 1990, the police archives were finally opened to historians and the events began to be pieced together. In 1991, the communist activist Jean-Luc Enguiodi published La Bataille de Paris and finally broke open a public conversation in France over what happened. He exaggerated the number of Algerians who were murdered, but nonetheless, it allowed for an investigation and research to finally be conducted in earnest. Ten years later, in 2001, the city of Paris became the first institution of the French state to acknowledge what happened for the mayor of Paris, Bertrand Delaunier, who unveiled a memorial. But it is here, in this acknowledgement, that another big mistake is made in remembering. Neither the city, its memorial, or the Republic ever acknowledged the responsibility for what happened. Instead, the fingers were always pointed at Maurice Papon. Maurice Papon was and continues to be the man everyone points at as ultimately responsible. The structures that enabled his rise to power are infrequently discussed and mostly disguised. If you ever go to Paris, you will notice that the memorial is no longer at the bridge. That is because it was continuously broken and vandalized. It is suspected, possibly even by members of the French police. A new memorial had to be constructed several feet away from the bridge, out of sight and therefore better protected. What France failed to do and so far continues to fail at doing is to acknowledge the institutional legacy that caused what happened that night in 1961, a failure to confront institutional legacies. Every time you see a headline of a brutal police killing in France, in which someone with a migrant background is brutally killed, every time you read headlines of French police acting in a completely over-the-top brutality against protesters or just ordinary football fans, or every time you read news headlines of French police officers and French police bosses tolerating neo-Nazi marches or having ties to neo-Nazis revealed, then you are seeing an echo of an institutional legacy. You are seeing the ghost of 1941. You are seeing the ghost of Vichy, you are seeing the ghost of Trancy, you are seeing the ghost of 1961, you are seeing the ghost of Maurice Papon, and the ghosts of all those who worked for him in the name of the French state. But this does not just concern France. This is one of the main differences between police brutality in the United States and Europe. The extent of police brutality in European countries correlates with the Nazi occupation and the extent of a subsequent lacking denazification. I mentioned Greece at the beginning of this video. Greece used to be notorious for its brutal police. Some of you in the audience who are old enough may remember the brutal police murder of the Greek teenager Alexandros Geropopoulos in 2008 and the widespread riots that this murder caused in Greece. The majority of the Greek population was active in the resistance during the Nazi occupation. By some estimates, up to two-thirds of the Greek population were active in the resistance against the Nazis. But there were also Greek collaborators, and most of those were Greek police officers who the Nazis relied on to occupy and brutalize Greece. Most infamously, the police of Thessaloniki who rounded up and deported the Jews of Salonika to Auschwitz. After the Nazi occupation of Greece ended, civil war broke out between monarchists and republicans. The British intervened to support the monarchists, who eventually won the civil war and a far-right military dictatorship came to power in Greece with British support. In a cruel twist of historical irony, in a country that had largely resisted the Nazis, it was the people who had worked with the Nazis who ended up in charge of the state after the Nazi occupation. These included the Greek policemen who had worked with the Nazis in the deportation of the Jews and the brutalization of the Greek public. And those Greek policemen who had collaborated with the Nazis consequently created the oppressive and violent police institutions that Greeks rioted against in 2008. Police brutality in Europe, unlike the United States, is more often than not a legacy of authoritarian regimes and states. It is in part a legacy of communism. In the early 2000s, three out of ten German police officers were former Stasi, and it is notable how there was more police brutality in East Germany compared to West Germany. Police brutality in Europe is also a legacy of fascism. One only need look to Spain to see that. But the places in Europe where police brutality is the worst are those that were occupied by the Nazis, where the police then worked with the Nazis, where the police was turned into an institution on a war fitting against its own people, and where little to nothing was done after the war to remove those people or change the institutions after the end of Nazi occupation. This is why the French police is so notoriously brutal and violent. French police brutality is a legacy institution of the Nazi occupation of Europe. If France wishes to ever overcome its police brutality problem, it will have to confront the legacies of almost a century of historical policy failures in managing its police. 